give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. When I come to die. Lord, that's really what it's all about. It's just, it's you. There's really nothing else that quite fits the bill. In any state that we're in, whether it's joy or whether it's tribulation, it doesn't really matter. We just need to be with you. And we need more of you. We want more of you, Lord. So just pray that you would bless our time together, Lord. This is a holy time to get in your word and just to think about you and knowing how important it is to be reminded of your grace and your goodness toward us. And Lord, to continue to learn what your word is trying to tell us in a world that is going the opposite direction. Lord, we just need more of your word. So, uh, Lord, bless our time as we get in this year. All right. Mark 11. How's it going, Chuck? Marla? How you guys doing? Would you call me a wino? You say why no? <laughs> I'm gonna get over here so I can look right at you. <sighs> also, stick your thumb into uh, Isaiah chapter five, and uh, today is May seventeenth, correct? Tomorrow's May 18th. I'll never forget May 18th. Remember what the anniversary of May 18th is? Mount St. Helens Blue in 1980. I know exactly where I was. I was at Medford's other place, and we were playing in a band, and we were all dressed the same. We were like a Vegas band kind of thing. And there was ash falling everywhere. It looked like it was snowing. And... Uh, 1980, 37 years ago tomorrow, Mount St. Heaven. You know, it's funny. They said that there would be no life in that area for years to come. And now it's just flourishing with foliage everywhere. It's just like you wouldn't even know it kind of happened except there's a big crater there. Yeah, Don. Yeah, 
I just love how evolution, the whole the theories of that, just get uh, shot down, and no one ever reports that. Just like you know the reason that the the lunar module when it landed, why it had long legs, they expected to see millions of years of dust, so that when they landed, they would be able to, and then realize there was only a few inches, which means young Earth, young Earth. But you know stuff like that. They don't report all that stuff, but. That's right. That's right. All right. So Mark 11, um, we're going to look at, we're going to start in 22 in a minute here, but Jesus is on his way to the cross. There will be no mercy. There will be no compassion. There will be no support. And he's going to face things alone. And we have to remember the saints. Sometimes we have to face things alone. Now, we always have the Lord with us, and Jesus always had the Father. Don't get me wrong. But there are certain things. That's why Jesus said, take up the cross. Take up the cross and follow me. I'll show you how it's done. But as you see Jesus walking to the cross, it's not fun. It's not comfortable. It's emotionally straining. It's hard because people hate him reject him don't support him he's got a few guys that look like a bunch of homeless football players following him you know the the disciples but i mean just think about that as a man what he must have felt and what it was like and guys that's really what the cross is all about when we take up the cross is to understand that sometimes there's not going to be mercy by man Sometimes you're not going to feel compassion by man. Sometimes you're not going to get the support of man. But you always have Jesus. Always. He'll always be there for you. So it's a good reminder when life seems to lack mercy, compassion, or support. Jesus is our great example. So we're walking with him here. It's Tuesday. It's Passion Week. And Peter has seen the fig tree dried up from the roots, and he was amazed. And Jesus gives a rather bizarre answer to it, and I just want to review this a little bit in verse 22, where it says, um, you know, he goes, Rabbi, Peter says, look, the fig tree which you curse has withered away. And so he just gives this bizarre answer. And he goes, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he'll have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you'll have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, we we went through a, a fairly long uh, exposition of that last week, but Guys, I want you to know something, that when I teach, I'm not just teaching you, I'm teaching me. I'm not saying, well, I am the worthy sage, and I'm going to pour forth my wisdom toward you because I've already got it down. And I realize that when I'm teaching you, I'm teaching me. So please don't always understand that. I'm just a few hours ahead, you know what I mean, as far as thinking about the passage and whatnot. And I just want to pray blessing on you. Lord, I thank you for these people. I thank you for this church. I thank you that you have been so good to us and so faithful and consistent in your grace. And I pray for a refreshing work of your spirit tonight. Meet us where we are. Remind us. Renew us. Refresh us. You said in your word, Lord, you promised you'd help us. You said you'd give us direction. You said your word is alive and powerful. So let that happen tonight. Amen. Even as your pastor, I realize that my job is not only to teach, but also to apply what I teach to myself. So I'm not telling you I'm Mr. Got It All Together and I'm going to tell you a thing or two and tell you a what for. I mean, this is, you know, I got it all down and get my book and it'll show you the seven steps of how I got it down. But it's like I 
learn from it as well. And so I've been doing some real personal scrutiny on my mountains. And, uh, and we talked about that last week, about speaking to the mountain. And it's not about claiming and, and uh, you know, looking for the new house and, and the new spouse or the new getting rid of the old louse, whatever it is. But it's the idea of speaking to the things that are obstacles that are blocking or displaying like they're cool or displaying like they're fruitful but they're really not once you get up to them. Jesus saw the fig tree and he cursed it because it displayed it by the display of the leaves that should have had fruit on it, immature, but still edible fruit. And the fact that it didn't, that it displayed fruitfulness and it didn't have fruit, Jesus cursed the fruit. And so when Peter said, hey, master, look, what you cursed is dried up to the root and it's exactly what the mountain is all about is just having faith in God, going to the root, like whatever mountain, whatever obstacle you're facing, go to the root, follow, go back and go, okay, whatever that mountain is, go back to it, figure out what it is and start cursing the root. Curse it, speak to it, speak to the root. If it's an addiction, if it's a habit, if it's a, a particular situation that is going on in your life, if it's unforgiveness, if it's bitterness, if it's a sort of a self-pity kind of a thing, speak to it and say, I speak to the self-pity, I speak to the bitterness, that's my mountain, Lord, and I, tell, I curse it to the root. And you just start speaking to it. Have faith in God, don't doubt in your heart. Start speaking to whatever that mountain is because I think the church has become way too filled with excuses as to why we can't rather than why we can. Because we've been taught that. Well, you just, you know, yeah, we have to admit that we have these issues, but God, Jesus said, have faith in God. And anything that's going on, you ha don't doubt in your heart, and whatever you ask for, you shall have. Because the Lord says, I want your life to be a display that is fruitful. And any area that is not fruitful Curse it to the root, it's worthless. I don't care what it looks like on the outside. I care about what it looks like on the inside. I don't want you to be dried up to the root. I want you to be full of fruit. And so we have to speak to those things and those obstacles and cast them out and be driven into the sea. So Jesus gave us a great way of dealing with it. And so I began to do that. And I'm not kidding. This is the God honest truth. I started doing it and I saw answers immediately. I saw God do things in a very special way. And I went, okay, only God knew this. And I'm watching and said, Lord, and I even spoke to my unbelief. Remember the guy, the father with his son, he goes, you know, Lord, help my unbelief. So sometimes unbelief is a mountain. I just started speaking to it, Lord. I'm, I'm not going to doubt in my heart, but if I am doubting, if that's another mountain, I curse out to the root, and I just start, speak to it. Speak to it. You keep speaking to it. You get it out of the way. It's not going to do you any good. So get it out of the way, and as I began to do that, I began to watch the Lord answer those prayers. I don't know. It's just what he said to do. So I started doing that, and I started seeing it take place. So faith working through love isn't a liability, but rather a liberty the Lord wants to liberate us. So we continue the countdown to the cross. As I said, it was Tuesday. So after Jesus gives the lesson on the fig tree, they headed up to the city now. Remember, you're always going up to Jerusalem. And uh, uh, it appears that the leaders were waiting for Jesus. He had just caused uh, wreaked some havoc the day before turning over the tables and causing a big scene, saying this won't be how you guys have made this place a den of thieves. So when Jesus splits and he comes back, they're all waiting for him. Now, this must have been interesting as they're walking up. He can see that they're all waiting for him. And it says here in verse 27, Then they came to Jerusalem, that is, Jesus and the boys. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. Ooh, the big guns now. You got the chief priests, 
you got the scribes, you got the elders. This is big. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Why are they asking that? Because of what he did the day before, turning over the tables, saying, get this out of here. You've made this house a house of merchandise. You've made it a den of thieves. You're ripping off the people. My house shall be called a house of prayer. And they're going, where do you get off? Where do you get your authority? And who gave this authority? So what authority are you doing this? And who gave it to you? Now, this is amazing to me because for three years, Jesus has been showing he has authority. After all the miracles and signs, they still want to know his credentials. So that's why we have to understand that miracles do not produce faith. They don't help you believe more. That's why trying to work yourself up in a Pentecostal frenzy isn't going to help your faith any more than just believing in God. And sometimes we need that Pentecostal frenzy and that emotion, but they saw all these miracles that Jesus was doing, and they didn't believe a whit of who he was. So they're like, you know, Jesus, Yeshua, is what they would have named him, what rabbi do you sit under? Did you go to Hebrew University there in Jerusalem? What Bible college did you go to? You know, kind of asking these things. Where did you get your BA, your Master of Divinity? Did you get it in Galilee? Where, who, who do you think you are? Now they're talking to God in human flesh. Who do you think you are? And like today, some people ask questions not because they want an answer, but they want to debate. And often people will ask certain questions like this not because they want an answer, but they want to fight. They want to have a debate with you. And so to us, they might say to us, well, Harvey, where do you get your authority? And, and Lori, where do you get the authority to, to baptize or whatever? They think, well, where do you guys get off? How, how can you do that? You know, who, who, what rabbi are you under? What priest are you under? Who, whose authority are you? It's kind of like, and it's a setup question. It's kind of like for the J-dubs, it's the watchtower. That's our authority. For the Mormons, it's their priesthood and their current living prophets, so-called living prophets. Or for the Seventh-day Adventists, it's Ellen G. White. That's their authority. But for us, it's the Word of God. That's our authority, and I'll prove it to you in John 1, 12 to 13. John writes, But as many as have received him, who's the him? Have you received Jesus here today? Okay, if you've received him, this is for you. To them, he gave the right. You know what that word right means? Authority. You have been given the authority, the power and authority to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That is, you were born again. It was of the spirit. That's where you get your authority. So when people come to you and say, well, where do you get your authority? Well, that's easy. I believe in Jesus. He gave me the authority. He gave me the right to become a child of God. I don't need the permission from some other man to make sure whether I bless someone or not, whether I baptize someone or not, whether I'm teaching the Bible to somebody or not. But these people, they wanted to argue. And I, I love this because, you know, guys, I am not a debater, and I hate it. I'm not into debates. You know, they, they do a lot of this in, in college and stuff, and people, they, they get into debates and stuff like that. And I understand it's sort of like a competition thing. And debating has gotten so bad, it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. It just matters if you win the debate. It doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. And that's how lawyers win cases of people who are guilty. is all get out because they had a better argument. And they were able to convince the jury of a better argument, even though this guy knows full well that this guy is guilty of sin. But he got him off because he debated better. He had a better argument. But for me, personally, 
Uh, when I get with people and they want to argue doctrine, I'm not into it. I want to talk about doctrine. I want to talk about Jesus, the ultimate doctrine, Jesus Christ. But Paul dealt with this, and he said in 2 Timothy 2, 23 and 24, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Well, what do you think about this, Jeff? What do you think about that, Jeff? What do you think? Well, I think. How's that? And uh, But I'm not going to try to take a uh, necessary position and push it on somebody. When they're asking me, what do you think of this? They're not looking for an answer. They're looking to start some, or generate some kind of conversation to get into a debate. So I, the Bible says avoid that stuff. It just generates strife. He says, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient and humility, and correcting those who are in opposition. So, if you talk with an unbeliever, like for instance, if a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon comes to the door, don't slam the door in their face. Be gentle. And understand that the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. The gospel is veiled to them. Their minds, the minds, uh, that is, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, 2 Corinthians 4 tells us. The God of this world blinds them, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, should shine upon them if they place their faith and trust in him. So while we need to avoid debates, we certainly need to show compassion and love towards someone who might be trying to debate us or whatever, we're to be gentle with them. And this is how Jesus, tonight we're going to watch our master teacher at work as he tackles really tough questions. And so here's what they ask him. But what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? But notice Jesus answers the question with a question. I will ask you one question. Then answer me, and I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, keep in mind, this is God in human flesh, and they're questioning the authority of God in human flesh. Where do you get off? Who do you think you are? He goes, well, I'll be glad to answer that if you can answer this. The baptism of John. Was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. So Jesus puts them on the defensive, and they knew, like if Jesus had said, well, I'm God in human flesh, they would have rejected that. They would have said, you're, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. You're Beelzebub. You're demon-possessed or whatever. Yeah, even though he, was, he would have been telling them the truth, he knew they would reject that truth and that he was the actual authority. So a question about John the Baptist's authority, because John the Baptist was what? The forerunner to the coming Christ, right? So they reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, Wow. He'll say, why then did you not believe him? And he would have asked them that. But if we say from men, well, they feared the people. Because, you know, they were just in politics. And they just wanted to stay in the game. We would call it the establishment today. They want to stay in the establishment. So they wanted to keep the, ha the, the people happy. So they feared the people for all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. And so... They knew they were stuck either way, but they were unwilling, listen, they were unwilling to have an honest conversation. Wait a minute. Jesus asked them a question. He goes, well, I'll answer it if you, if you answer this question. And so they're busted because suddenly they can't answer the question because they're not going to be honest with themselves. And Jesus is expo exposing the dishonesty and saying, you guys really don't want it to know where I got my authority. You just want to try to debate me and disqualify me. And so verse 33 says, so they answered and they said to Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus then said, okay, well, I'm not going to tell you what authority I do these things. How's that? So Jesus exposes them, all right? Now, again, they weren't being forthright, so why should he answer? And why should you? See what I mean? In other words, this is how Jesus teaches us. This is how you deal with it. If they want to ask, if they just want you to answer their questions, but they don't want to answer yours, then don't waste their time. Because he goes, I'm not going to. Well, Jesus, they were, you know, 
why didn't Jesus try to save them? They were lost. Yeah, they were lost. They were lost. Didn't mean that Jesus didn't care about them, but he goes, I'm not going to break through that. I'm not going to break through unbelief. And so, you guys, if you're not going to be honest with me, I'm not going to. I'm not going to be forthright with you if you're not going to be forthright. So now here it comes in chapter 12. He throws them a curveball to let them know that he's fully aware of their intentions. Okay, verse 1. Then he began to speak, 12 verse 1, he began to speak to them in parables. Okay, now remember, we started that in Mark chapter 4, and we spent some time on a lot of the different parables. A lot of the parables were speaking of the kingdom of God, but this is a parable, and I don't know if we talked about this, but the word parable means alongside of, that is para is alongside, and bowl is B-O-L-E, is to cast. So the idea is to cast alongside. I'm going to, uh, kind of a fishing term, but the idea is I'm going to cast something alongside of you that you can understand. I'm going to share a parable with you, a spiritual truth, to bring it to earthly understanding. So I'm going to share this thing with you, this parable. So Jesus would cast alongside this earthly story with a heavenly meaning to make the heavenly meaning easier to understand and apply for the people. And he said, a man planted a vineyard. Now the minute a Jew would hear that, their ears would perk up. And that's why I wanted to draw your attention to Isaiah 5 in a minute. This imagery would be familiar to them. The vineyard, of course, he's talking about is Israel. And the man who planted is none other, none other than God himself. So he first says, a man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. The vine dressers, of course, stand for the rulers of Israel. So now, with that in mind, flip over to Isaiah 5. This is how they would understand it. Everybody there? We're just going to read through verse 7. Now let me sing to my beloved. This is God speaking to Israel. A song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved was a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. That's Jerusalem. He dug it up. He cleared out its stones. He planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes. In other words, God did everything possible for them to profit and to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge. It shall be burned and break down its wall. It shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it for the vineyard of the Lord of the hosts in the house of Israel and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant he looked for justice but behold oppression for righteousness but behold a cry for help okay so this is a very well you can go back now this is a very well known passage to every Jew so the vineyard that Jesus is speaking of of course is Israel. So their ears are perking up as Jesus is sharing this particular uh, vignette or parable. Okay? So, of course, this is prior to their captivity into Babylon. So now Jesus is saying kind of the same thing. You remember a couple weeks ago when he was in the temple, he would say, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets. Remember, he said all that. And, oh, how I wanted to gather you as a, chi uh, as a mother hen would gather her chicks, but you were not willing. Well, listen now to the parable, verse 2. 
Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dresser that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dresser. So we could call that rent. They came to collect the rent, okay? The servants or the owner sent, they, now of course the servants would be, stand for the prophets. And they took him and they beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent them another servant and at him they threw stones wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully treated and again he sent another and him they killed and many others beating some and killing some now in your reference you might find there second chronicles 36 16 which says this but they mocked that is Israel, the messengers of God, despised God's words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. So now it's happening again. Therefore, verse 6, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to him last, saying, well, of course they will respect him son but those vine dressers said among themselves this is the heir come let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours so they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard so it was the prophets that were sent by God here to collect the rent as it were to collect the fruit but every time God sent a prophet their way, they beat him, they killed him, they kicked him out. And then when the landowner, when God himself says, I'm going to send my son, they will respect my son. Jesus is telling them, but you're going to kill him because you want the inheritance for yourself. You want to take, remember he called Jerusalem or the temple, a den of thieves, and they wanted to take the inheritance from Jesus as Messiah and wanted it for themselves. So that was their plan. So Jesus asked, after he tells this story, and they're listening, and he's doing this in front of not only them, but there's a crowd of people all around, and it's right in front of everybody. He goes, therefore, what will the owner, that is, what will God what will the owner of the vineyard, what will God who owns Israel, what will he do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. I mean, he's looking at the elders, the scribes, and the priests and saying, you're going down. Dude, that's heavy duty. You guys are going You're going to kill me, but you're going down. That's exactly happened. what happened by 70 A.D. And God was so, oh, so patient. But it finally did happen. So, but he's going to give the vineyard to others. So the typical rabbinical form of teaching in the parables was to give a story, to ask the question, okay, what's the owner of the vineyard going to do? What would you do as the owner of the vineyard? Okay, and then allow the audience to come to their own conclusion. And this is what is really good for you and for me when we're sharing Jesus with people. Our job is not to convert anybody. Our job is to help people think, share a story, ask a question, and allow them to draw their own conclusion because ultimately it's the Spirit of God that draws anybody to Christ. Because I think a lot of times we try to seal the deal. Here, use this prayer card. And we don't really know if it took or not. I just know that whoever wants the Lord is going to get the Lord. Whoever really has a heart for the Lord is going to get God's heart. Not someone who's talked into a prayer. But someone who is, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just simply saying it's not as automatic as we think. 
The idea is to allow them to come to their own conclusion. And that's the format that Jesus used here. Now, why did he use the vineyard? Well, remember, parables were pictures. And throughout all of Judah, there were nothing but vineyards. So he goes, he's talking to the land of vineyards. This was like their top economical pull was, or trade, was grapes. Okay, so so he's saying, yeah, there was a vineyard. <laughs> you know, it's like, you guys get in the picture here? There was a vineyard, a bunch of vineyards behind me. You guys get it? There was a vineyard. And you vine dressers have been killing every messenger my father has sent. You're going to kill me, but you're going down. That's the bottom line. So the, he uses that, but then the analogy, uh, he gives the analogy of their own scriptures. Now I want to give you four things that this parable tells us about God. I think this is really really important because my oh my the heart of God for the nation of Israel if God is still willing to save the nation of Israel with all that has gone on in their history how much more you and me if we blow it you know because people go oh I've just blown it so bad I've just been so terrible and you get your plastic hammer and you're beating yourself. God, is this good? Do I do it a few more times? And, you know, you just so, and you're going, now, wait a minute. Israel is such a perfect example of a wayward heart and God keeps reaching and he keeps reaching. So number one, I want you to notice something about God in this parable. Number one is generosity. God is a generous God. God equipped the vineyard with everything, that is, equipped the nation with everything necessary to give something for the vine dressers to do, to do something that would be easy and profitable for them. Don't ever shortchange God. God is a generous God with you. He's given you everything you could possibly ever need or want to be profitable in life. Everything. We are the ones who destroy that. Not God, but we are the ones that destroy that. And that's why we need God's grace. Because not having God's grace, we would really have a hard time with his generosity, realizing we had wasted it and thrown it out. But his generosity, number one. Number two, his confidence in them. His confidence in them. God as the owner gave them Israel, gave them the promised land, and left it to them. Take care of it. Joshua, it's all yours. Take the promised land. All yours. I'm going to get out of the way. I'll help you win it. I'll help you take it. I trust you. I have confidence in you. Run the vineyard. Run the nation freely. It's all yours. God wasn't like, I want that. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give he wasn't greedy. He was like, you guys, this is yours. I'll protect you. I'll be with you. I am confident in you. Joshua, you can do it. Have good courage. And he gave it to the nation of Israel to take care of on their own. So his generosity, number one. His confidence, number two. And number three, his patience. God had undeserving patience as they attacked one prophet after another prophet after another prophet after another prophet after another prophet. Read them all. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Hosea, all of them. Amos and Andy, just kidding. Amos, okay. Uh, Zechariah, all of them. They would, they would not listen to God's messenger. But God was patient until he sent his beloved son. And they would not, he thought, okay, they'll respect my son. And they threw him out and they killed him and said, we're going to take you, take it from you. I mean, it was already theirs. They had the nation. 
But see, they wanted the power. They wanted to be the God of the nation, as it were. But God was patient. And then finally, so not only his generosity, his confidence in them, his patience, but then finally, number four, his ultimate justice. His ultimate justice. After a while, and we've been learning this in the book of Romans, taking advantage of God's patience, in the end, there's going to come a time when the Lord says, that's it. I'm done. Enough. Finish. I have to judge you because I'm a just God. I can't put up with this kind of activity where you're attacking my son, you're attacking my people, you are trying to destroy what is mine, and you're trying to take it for yourself, and that's what our world is doing right now. Doesn't want God, doesn't want to even believe there is a God, wants to create some other way in which creation came on the earth. They're trying to rob it from God, you see? And God is so patient. Isn't he patient? Would you guys be that patient? I wouldn't be that patient. I'd be like, let's dust these guys and get the millennial kingdom started, you know? Let's do this thing, you know? But the Lord's like, he's so patient. But there's going to come a time where the patience is going to run out, and he is going to judge. And the Bible tells us that, that in the end, he does all things, you know, all things. He does all these things. And his justice was deserved. It was the right time. It was the right, you know, we're all going to agree with his justice and how he judged and how he waited and whatnot. It's his ultimate justice will have to come. So his generosity, his confidence, his patience, his ultimate justice. So Israel is spoken of, we talked about last week, figuratively of three different trees, okay? You got the fig tree got the olive tree, and you got the vineyard, okay? When Jesus cursed the fig tree, it withered and died, okay? Because why? It failed. It displayed fruit. It said, I am fruitful, but there was no fruit on it, and Jesus cursed it. So we've already seen a type of Israel's troubles how they display spirituality, 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 yeah. And they display it, but they're fruitless. And so because of that, Jesus cursed that fruitlessness because it was displaying as if it was fruitful. It's hypocritical. And now he's speaking to the vineyard, and it's the same thing. This time, it's their... It's what they're doing to the nation and what they're doing to God's messengers. And now he is shutting that down. So the nation have failed to fulfill her purposes. And like the vineyard, God was about to take it away again. And it's really sad when you go to Israel sometime to see a nation so desperately wanting God to come back and Jesus is staring them right in the face and they don't see it. It's the, it's the greatest heartbreaker when you go into the temple institute and they're just, oh, if the Messiah would just come back and it's going, he's here, he's here, he just wants to just let him in, just believe, you know, it's just like, it's so hard it's so frustrating to just see them and you, you, your heart breaks for them. You just go, because they've been taught by the rabbis and by all the added writings, Jesus is not the Messiah. They probably all lead to these men right here, the genealogies, if you probably follow them through. So it's a heartbreaker. So the nation is going to, but that was, listen, that's what's going to open the door to what? They're not Jews. Who are they? They're Gentiles. So you're already seeing, I'm going to give this vineyard to others. Give it to others. Now, there's coming a day that God will restore because he loves Israel. Those are his special people. 
He's going to restore them once again. But right now, he's working with the Gentiles, with the others. We're the others. So now, he tells him this, and then the Lord quotes from Psalm 118, and he talks about God's work of the Spirit in a very devastating way. And so he looks at them and he says, have you not even read this scripture? And of course they have. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Why is it marvelous in our eyes? Because exactly what God said happened when we saw it. And they marveled at it. But it was a prophecy in Psalm 118 that the stone, Jesus Christ, which the builders, the leaders of Israel, rejected, was the chief cornerstone. And God said it would happen that way, and it was happening that way, and it was marvelous in their eyes. They're like they were marvelled, and I marvelled at it. That, I mean, when you look at all the prophecies that were come to pass in minute detail, doesn't it blow your mind? And it so kills me how, you know, the world looks at, well, you know, Romans lived like this, and we have all this evidence, and yeah. But you got all this evidence of biblical stuff, and we don't want to believe that. We reject that, but we certainly believe in all the evidence of how a Roman used to clothe himself and what he drank, and what because we have all this pottery and all this evidence. And you've got loads of manuscript evidence of, of biblical times far outweighing Roman history. And yet, well, we're not really sure about that. You don't, they don't want to believe that. Amazing. So Jesus was saying to them in, in by using this particular passage in Psalm 118, you're doing what you were predicted to do. Wow. I would not be one, I would not want to be one who was predicted that I'd be one of the people who rejected the chief cornerstone. Because someone had to fulfill that role, just like Judas had to fulfill that role. I wouldn't want to be the son of perdition. It was going to happen, but I wouldn't want to be the dude who was going to fulfill that, even though it was prophesied hundreds of years before it ever took place. Now, here's what's interesting about this. You remember we talked about always take note of the passages that repeat themselves over and over and over again? God wants to get a message across. This passage is one of those passages. This passage is quoted very often in the New Testament. Peter quotes it twice in Acts 4.11 and in his letter 1 Peter 2.7-8. through 8. He quotes this same verse because he was there when he heard this. G- uh, Peter was here and when he heard Jesus say this, he used it in Acts chapter 4 when he was preaching to the Israeli leaders, okay? And then in First Peter talking about the rock, Jesus being the rock. And Paul quotes it in regards to the building of the church, Ephesians 4.20, and in 1 Corinthians 3.11, he speaks of Jesus as the foundation, what we build our lives upon, using this particular verse. And anytime we see something repeated many times, it's really significant. How many know the the most quoted verse, but the most the most uh, let's say strange verse uh, that is quoted the most in the New Testament? How many can say? How many know which one it is? The Psalm. No Psalm one ten verse one. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. You think, well, why is that quoted so many times? Well, it's quoted a lot of times because it's speaking of Jesus Christ, that he supersedes Melchizedek. And that verse is used several times throughout the New Testament, more than any other verse 
in the New Testament, out of all the Old Testament uh, passages, you're thinking, that's a stranger verse to be repeated many times. But if it's repeated many times, you have to take note of this, why that is. So the cornerstone, as you know, what is the cornerstone, guys? It's the stone that fits in the corner. Okay. It's the basis by which the weight stands, that everything, it has to be built upon that cornerstone. And the concept of the stone and pointing to Jesus is throughout all of Scripture. Okay. Remember Daniel saw the vision of the stone came and hit the image and it became a huge mountain, right? And it filled the whole earth. And you guys have probably heard this story, but it bears repeating because uh, I don't know where it came from. It could be tradition, but uh, or it could be from one of the historians. But the story goes that when Solomon's temple was being built, they would cut and chisel. You couldn't have any sound near the temple because <laughs> can you imagine trying to worship and you're hearing ching, 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 ching. You know, people would not want to go worship there. So not a sound could be heard at the temple area. And so they did that miles away in the quarry. And these stones were cut so perfectly that when they were placed upon each other, they all have, it's amazing how they did this without computers or anything. It's just the technology back then seemed so dated, but it was like, these stones were so perfectly cut in the quarries and they fit so perfectly you don't you didn't need any mortar or cement to hold them together you could they were they were cut so perfectly you couldn't even put a knife into them so when they brought them in they would just simply place them and interlock them in place well the story goes that when the builders were building this temple and this is miles away they're bringing these 20-ton stones to the site. And the story tells us that they brought the cornerstone, but the builders had other stones to, to put into place first, and they go, well, what's this stone? Well, this is the cornerstone or whatever. And they go, well, we don't need that now. We need the other stones. And so they threw that stone aside. And it took seven years to build the temple. So what do you think happened to that stone after a few years? Weeds, grass. It pretty much got buried in, in bushes and whatnot, okay? And so it's just sitting there this whole time. Well, they're getting ready to finish this, the temple. And the builders say, hey, we're ready for the cornerstone. And the chiselers are going, we sent that to you years ago. You did? See, they rejected the stone. Um, hmm. And then someone goes, wait a minute. You remember that stone way back, six and a half years ago, whatever? It's, it's, it's over there. It's over there in the weeds. And they realized that that stone was the stone that was rejected, but now it was the very stone that fit perfectly in place. It was the chief cornerstone, and it fit perfectly in its place. I love that story. So, the stone the Beatles rejected has become the chief cornerstone, but now it was honored in a final ceremony to complete the temple. So thus, this psalm, Psalm 118, this idea of the chief cornerstone, the Lord's doing its marvels in our eyes, is, uh, has powerful prophetic significance pointing to Jesus. Because remember, he said he was being rejected. He's the rejected stone. And he was asserting that as Messiah. So they hear all this stuff. And in verse 12, it says they sought to lay hands on him because they really wanted to hang out with him. No, <laughs> they but feared the multitude, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. 
So they left him and went away. Can you imagine the rage in the eyes of these individuals? They just wanted him dead, and they wanted him dead now. And Jesus just walked away. But they feared the people, and they go, well, we don't want to cause any problems. But Jesus just nailed them. You guys are going down. Verse 13 then says, Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees. Now notice that they're sending them to him. Hey, see if you can foil this guy. See if you can. He, he just told us what for. Uh, you guys go try it. So he sends the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. Not to catch him, but to catch him in his words. Not to appreciate, but now they're going to use flattery to throw him off guard. And when they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one. For you don't, you don't regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. So they're trying to work up. And he goes, uh, Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, okay, the fig tree, the display looks fruitful, but it's not. Knowing their hypocrisy, he goes, why do you guys test me? What do you guys, well, you're messing with me. What are you testing me for? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. Isn't that interesting? Jesus didn't have a denarius on him. So the denarius, as you guys have seen pictures, I think we have pictures of it, but the denarius was a small silver coin about the size of a dime and it would, could only be minted by the Caesar, the emperor. He's the only one who could mint these. And they would be gold or silver coins. And the inscription on it would say, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. And so it would have his image on it. And at this time, Judah was a Roman province. And the governor was di uh, directly appointed by Rome. And so... Israel was heavily taxed. This is why Israel hated the tax collectors. Okay? I mean, how many of y'all like taxes? <laughs> okay, so the question in those days was, should we pay taxes? Who should pay taxes? What kind of taxes should they be? How much should we pay? Should we do a flat tax? And you're hearing all this stuff. Now, in those days, they had built the Roman roads. Someone had to pay for them. Okay? They had the Roman aqueducts where the water would flow, and there's some of them still exist today, uh, you know, in some form, where the water would flow. Well, somebody had to pay for that. And then you had the uh, the uh, Pax Romana, which was the, the, the soldiers of peace who would govern the roads and the tolls and all that stuff to make sure that there was peace in every region. And whatnot, well, they had to be paid. Money had to come from somewhere. So guess where it comes from? Us, the people. So when they're getting ready to build a school, I can't believe it. We were in Cresswell. They built a junior high school. Got taxed. Now they're building another high school, a junior high school here. Going to get taxed again for another high school, <laughs> you know. Uh, but taxes, man, they're, they're, uh, they're not fun. But. Government takes taxes from us to pay for things, okay? So there were three basic taxes that the Jews had to deal with. You had the property tax. They had to give one-fifth of their fruit, which grew on their land, okay? And that meant less money for them. They had a flat 5% income tax and then a day's wage or a denarius for, listen to this, you had to pay a denarius a year just to exist. If you existed, you had to pay a day's wage, basically, to the government just to exist, okay? So this is how crazy it was. So they're trying to trap Jesus, and no matter how he answers, if he says it's lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, then some Jews would turn away from Jesus and not listen to him anymore. And if he says it's not lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, then they could find reason to bust him and as a leader of sedition and have him arrested and thrown in jail. So, this is the best, verse 16. So he goes, you got a coin? 
He didn't have one himself. He goes, you got a coin? Let me see it. So they brought it, and he said, can you see him just looking at it? Whose image and superscription or inscription is, is on this coin? And they said to him, Caesar's, very proudly. And Jesus answered and said, well, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Is too much for us. We marvel at it. And Lord, we just marvel at you tonight. We marvel not the way they marveled, but how you were able to handle the tough questions. And Lord, how you were able to do it in a gentle way, but in a powerful and potent way. And Lord, that's what we want in our life. As we go to the table tonight, we just want to thank you for being our champion, for battling those who want to rip us off, spiritually for battling the enemy, for giving us power over the enemy, for giving us the power of your word. Lord, I know that this is... Uh, these confrontations were much, much more intense than we can imagine. And Lord, you handled yourself beautifully, and we thank you for that. And I thank you that your word says that you are our advocate. You're our defense lawyer, and you defend us, Lord. And, uh, and we are forever thankful for your defense. So, Lord, as we just gather at the table, as we give you thanks, Lord, bless the communion. Bless each person here as they commune with you privately. They spend time with you. I pray, Lord, that whatever area of defense that they need, Lord, that they would take it to you tonight. 